one more minute maybe or half. So let me start by saying uh, welcome to the first call this this uh, in 2023. A lot of things have gone down, a lot of very interesting and very uh, almost uh, existential uh, crises have erupted in banking, as is seems to be the norm every 10 years or so. Um, and there is a thesis by Minsky which says that uh, there is an instability in the capital markets, financial uh, markets instability thesis, uh, which you know he did a lot of work on many years ago. But uh, obviously, some of this uh, uh, presentation that you're about to see uh, is addressing that instability in the heart of the system. Uh, in some ways, anyway. Um, and uh, two things. One is we are operating under the Linux Foundation Code of Conduct, which says that uh, you can disagree with whatever the speaker says, uh, but you can't be disagreeable. That is the first thing. Uh, you can have a, a nice sort of debate about things, but don't descend into, uh, uh, you know, being one of our uh, uh, evolutionary ancestors. So <laughs> the other, the other, uh, well, descend or ascend, I don't know what, what that is at this moment, but the other uh, code of conduct thing is that we are operating also under the, um, you know, uh, trust uh, uh, laws of uh, United States, uh, which, or wherever you are, that means, uh, uh, you know, we are obviously not conducting these uh, under a cloak of secrecy so that we can uh, take over the world. These, these are the two uh, things. And uh, without uh, uh, holding you guys up too much more, we are, going to go straight to Tony and Tony will um, tell me to make a, you know, do the presentation. I'll uh, share my screen and he'll ask me to advance or retreat or whatever number of, uh, you know, the share number, uh, the, the uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the slide number he'll, he'll tell me to go to. Um, the other uh, point is he's, um, um, you know, he's busy in many ways. So um, he is going to be able to answer your questions when, uh, when, you, um, when you ask him. Uh, but uh, we are gonna have like, let's say 10 or 15 minutes of questions after his presentation or even more, maybe an open discussion would be a better way to move this conversation forward. Uh, since uh, Tony is involved in this uh, up to his neck, he's probably got everything uh, at the tip of his fingers. Um, the, so Tony is a managing director as uh, the slides will show in City. So obviously he's under some certain constraints, which of course he'll uh, uh, elucidate. This, uh, so Tony, shall I start sharing the screen? Sure, or by all means, you thank you. All right. And uh, please uh, excuse me if I'm um, using LibreOffice instead of Microsoft. Uh, All good. Uh, this is not it, though. So. Sorry. This is this is fine, isn't it? Uh, it takes a. Let me see. Why is it showing up under Google Chrome? Um, good question. I need. Uh, I need to. Uh, Let 
you know how it is. Uh, yeah, technology. Uh, Google Chrome, this is the LibreOffice. Uh, and I'll go into the slideshow part of it. You can see, you can all see it now, right? Yeah, looks good. Okay, so please, Tony. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, Bupin, and uh, thanks everyone for for joining today. I'm glad I'm glad we've got an intimate small group because we can have a conversation and get everyone involved in the conversation. Um, you'll excuse me if I have. Uh, I have a little cold, so I might sneeze from time to time. If I do so, rather than subject you to my sneezing, um, I, I'm just going to like if the screen goes blank for a second, and uh, it just it's just I've turned off my camera in order to sneeze. Um, but otherwise, uh, looking forward to the conversation. So to introduce myself, I'm Tony McLaughlin. I work in the payments business at Citibank. Um, I've been working in payments for 30 years um, with Citibank since 2004, but previously with um, HSBC, AB and Amro Bank in the Netherlands and also in uh, Barclays. And um, yeah, I've been at a very, very career always in, in payments. And so the perspective that I will share today comes from, you know, from that background as being a practitioner in the in the payment space. So in this um, uh, discussion today, I'll try I'll try to share with you you know what my journey has been uh, through this through this space, what which conclusions that I've reached. Um, as Vipin I think alluded to, there's no reason why you should uh, you know feel the need to agree with my conclusions I, I'd be very happy for, for for there to be significant levels of challenge and disagreement about the conclusions um I'll try to state my assumptions and my biases uh, you know clearly and hopefully uh, demonstrate that my conclusions do flow logically from um you know my observations and my and my starting position. So with all those caveats, um, you know, Vipin said that I'm a managing director of Citibank, so I'll have lots of constraints. Uh, try, try to find them, try to find my constraints. I mean, I'll try to speak as openly as possible um, and, and answer the questions as directly as I possibly can. So let's go to the first uh, the first page, Vipin, if you don't mind. The next slide. So, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been following the development of um, you know, cryptocurrencies and blockchains almost from the beginning. Um, when I, I first read the Bitcoin white paper many years ago, I, I thought it was a staggering, um, you know, work. It really challenged some of my, my assumptions, my fundamental assumptions about what money is and what money should be. And ever since then, um, you've all lived this journey as well. Um, but there's been this... Uh, thesis that I develop, which I, I I call the sometimes called the tokenization thesis or the DLT thesis, which is, you know, some people would have you believe that in the future, um, all or much of the financial system is going to move towards this kind of technology. Indeed, um, you know, large parts of the digital economy might move towards the adoption of this kind of technology. And, and that thesis is something that I um, I'm very interested in. I'm very interested in testing that thesis, and I can certainly see that there are attributes of the technology which are which are advantageous. Um, but but one uh, thing that I've never been comfortable with is almost positioning the te the technology as the antithesis of the traditional financial system. Now, I'm perfectly aware that the ideology in the Bitcoin white paper is about really decoupling money from the nation state. And I guess the founding um, belief is that you can't trust governments with money. And therefore, there should be some kind of digital money which is independent from the nation state and independent from you know, rent-seeking intermediaries such as the commercial banks and others. So I understand that being the origi original ideology, 
and clearly there's a huge amount of um, the technical design in in Bitcoin and, and thereafter in Ethereum, which is designed to bring a, a, about this, uh, you know, trustless way of people interacting. I see that that's baked in very de- very deeply into the into the philosophy of of blockchains. But nevertheless, there are aspects of the traditional financial system that I think um, do have value and should be preserved. And so the work that that I'm engaged in is is really to to ask the following question. Is there there an intersection? Is there an intersection, a kind of superset of benefits where we take the, the best of blockchain and again, coming to that list of what is the best of blockchain is uh, is is subjective. But can can we take the best of blockchain, the best of banking, and combine them in such a way that we get the best of both worlds, and at the same time perhaps um, ameliorate or eliminate the downsides of of each? So that's the um, if you like that's the the space that. I am exploring is that potential that potential intersection. So if we just move on deep into the next slide, and that you're just giving me a, a small break to go off screen for a second and uh, and sneeze, I'll be back with you for the next slide in about one second. Okay, sneezing sneezing break over. Thank you for bearing with me. So in order to elaborate on this idea further about examining this intersection, I want to double click into the world of money. And I'd start by reflecting that we we are living at a remarkable time in the history of money, where physical money that we've had for thousands of years is coming to an end. And in the future, all money will be digital. But as we embark on that journey, the question is, well, what type of digital money will we be using? And to, to my way of thinking, again, as a payments person, I can see five alternative types of money, of digital money. And they're listed on this page. And sometimes for dramatic effect, I like to think about it as a good old for- format format war. A good, good old fashioned format war. And this format war um, is probably the most consequential we'll ever experience in our lifetime. Much more important than VHS versus Betamax or Nokia versus Apple or you know, Kodak versus uh, digital photography, etc. Um, th- this format war for money is really foundational to the whole economic system. Because you know, money serves such a vital purpose in enabling commercial transactions to take place, to be agreed, for the whole price discovery system to work, for the execution of, of commercial agreements and the, um, the settlement of the obligations that arise in those commercial agreements. I can't think of any format war that's more important than the, this race between different types of digital money. Now, the way in which I categorize uh, the different types of digital money come from the the banker's perspective. So when I think about money, the the first reality of money for me as a banker is that money is a a liability. Meaning, and this is the traditional sense of money, that the money in your bank account is your asset but it's the bank's liability. So you're essentially making this uh, kind of loan to the bank and the bank promises to give you the money back whenever you demand it. And so you have counterparty risk against the bank. And so I categorize money in terms of the kinds of liability it represents. That's, that's, the, that's the base um, you know, nature of, of money. Well, it certainly was until Bitcoin came along. But let's start walking through these five different alternatives. The the first alternative is is central bank money. Now, I'm sure all of you have some central bank money 
but only in physical format. Uh, so you've got some notes and some coins, but the 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 CBDC wave, uh, the 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 massive number of projects by central banks looking at central bank digital currency really represents the ability for economic actors like you or I uh, to have an account at the central bank. And the type of money that we would be, hold, we would be holding in those wallets is central bank money, namely a liability of the nation state, a full faith and credit of the sovereign. That's an interesting type of money because if the sovereign owes you the money, there's no counterparty risk. And secondly, when transactions are made within central bank money, it, they usually have this uh, attribute called finality of settlement, which is that the transactions cannot be unwound through bankruptcy proceedings. So central bank money is a compelling type of money. In today's economic system, you're, you or I, we can have access to the paper form, but we can't have access to the digital form. Citibank and commercial banks, we've got um, accounts at the Bank of England, the, the Federal Reserve already. So we already have access to those reserves. So the question here is, is why shouldn't everyone have access to central bank money? And, and then it's worth thinking about what kind of economic system do we end up with if the majority of people decide to keep their money at the central bank? So I'll, I'll leave that question hanging for a second for the purposes of getting through the five different alternatives. But the first alternative is central bank money in digital form. The second alternative is the you know, it is the blockbuster, it's the Kodak, it's the incumbent, which is commercial bank money. Um, when you or I think about how much money we've got, we're thinking about how much money we have on the balance sheet of a commercial bank. Um, recent events have uncovered some of the nature of those liabilities. Um, but commercial bank money is by far the dominant form of digital money on the planet today. And Again, it's a liability of a commercial bank and commercial banks have counterparty risk. So it's not a risk-free form of money. And the fact that there's counterparty risk against a commercial bank is not a bug of the system, it's a feature. Sorry, Deepin, if you just stay back to the previous one, please. Your finger clicked for some reason. Oh. So this is the right one. So yeah, the... The fact that there's counterparty risk against the commercial bank is not a bug, it's a feature. And the reason for that feature is what we call money, our deposits on an account at a commercial bank, are the raw material for the creation of, of risk assets. And risk assets obviously come with, uh, with risk. So if a bank gets its asset side of the balance sheet wrong, then uh, the bank is at, uh, at risk of the... <laughs> if the borrowers don't pay the money back. So commercial bank money um, moves around in increasingly instant ways. Uh, most countries have developed instant payment schemes, um, you know, Visa, MasterCard keep getting better. Uh, believe it or not, SWIFT keeps getting better. I can give you some evidence of SWIFT getting better uh, through SWIFT GPI. So the plumbing for commercial bank money is getting better and better. But the question is, is it enough? Is, are, are the improvements taking place in the commercial banking system enough to meet the challenge of, of digital payments? The third type of money is um, issued by a regulated non-bank. So think of this as being PayPal type money. And the fact is that over the past 10 years, there's been a lot of talk about crypto, but all the action has been in this type of money. You know, literally hundreds of millions of customers and businesses around the world are using PayPal um, or Paytm in India has hundreds of millions of customers, Alipay, WeChat Pay, Mercado Pago, M-Pesa, I could go on and on, regulated non-banks issuing uh, virtual representations of fiat currency. Now, those monies, when you give your money to uh, a regulated non-bank into their wallet, that regulated non-bank puts the money into a commercial bank. So it kind of ends up being back in the commercial banking system, 
um, but you have a liability, uh, you hold a liability of a regulated non-bank. So that's what electronic money is. Now I'm going to pause here for a second because the three types of money that we've just described is, is one family unit. And that family unit is the sovereign currency system. Because whether the money is issued by the central bank, the commercial bank, or the electronic money institution, there are those liabilities, those types of money are all authorized by the nation state. They're issued under license by the nation state. And in fact, they've got a common core, which is um, it's a promise to pay you back your money on demand at par value, meaning one-to-one -one in national currency units. And if you think about it, the whole structure of financial regulation is designed to make sure that those promises are kept and that you get your money back. So this is the sovereign currency system made up of central bank money, commercial bank money, and e-money issued by regulated non-banks. Now then, then along came the novel forms of money, starting with Bitcoin, the public cryptocurrencies. And Bitcoin is a radical is a radical notion. I mean, maybe Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, what have you. These are, are a very radical notion because Bitcoin says money doesn't belong to the nation state. You can't trust nation states with money. The digital world needs a digital native form of money, which is not subject to the rent-seeking behavior of intermediaries and can flow frictionlessly across computer networks. And that's the that's the thesis of, uh, of Bitcoin. And, and money should not be um, a, a function of trust. So we have to build some kind of infrastructure where we know what everyone has got in their wallets, but no one needs to trust each other. And hence, a lot of the, um, the the machinery of Bitcoin is constructed around delivering on that on that thesis and delivering on that ideology. And 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 therefore, Bitcoin clearly is not a liability. Because you, if you want to have a trustless um, economic system, you don't build it upon someone's pro one person's promise to pay another person. Um, Bitcoin, therefore, is a kind of commodity form of money. And at the, at the moment, the accounting treatment of Bitcoin is actually as an intangible asset. Now, you can argue whether that accounting treatment is warranted or not, but that's currently the accounting treatment that people have to use when they put Bitcoin, for example, on their corporate balance sheets. It's accounted for as an intangible asset. It's accounted for largely in the same way as goodwill is accounted for, um, which means it's, it's subject to impairment accounting. Um, which is why you essentially, you don't market to market, you kind of market to the lowest value that it's achieved in the previous reporting period. So Bitcoin um, hasn't become, uh, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer method of payment. It hasn't primarily become a method of payment or medium of exchange. It's become this kind of speculative asset um, not the original intention, as you know, of the, the designers of Bitcoin, which is essentially to build a payment system. And, it, you know, it is what it is. You know, some, some countries, obviously, like El Salvador, have, have made it legal tender. We're currently in crypto winter. So, uh, you know, who, who knows what the, what the future path of, uh, of Bitcoin price will be uh, and whether it will ever become a, a, a mass market method of payment. But in the meantime, uh, due to that lack of stability and the, the volatility of Bitcoin prices, along came the stable coins. And the stable coins are this kind of weird, you know, kind of weird Frankenstein's monster, which is a combination of the, the crypto technology, but slaving that technology to the, the values created by the fiat currency system. So pegging these instruments to the US dollar and other fiat currencies. Which again, if you go back to the original uh, Bitcoin ideology, seems a, a strange place to reach if you're a if you're a Bitcoin maximalist. But what are the stable coins? Well, again, 
they they are meant to trade at par value on exchanges. They're meant to stay at one to one. Um, are they a liability? Uh, you know, good question. If you hold a Tether token, do you have a contract with Tether? If you have a USDC token, do you have a contract with Circle? Uh, you know, some some of the holders perhaps do. You can you can sign up. They've got their terms and conditions, which tells you the redeemability. Um, but it's not like it's not the same kind of legal relationship that you have with other issuers of electronic money. Like if you've got a PayPal account. You've actually got a contract with PayPal that says that they'll pay you the money back. If you've got a bank account, you've got a contract with the bank that says you'll pay them, they'll, they'll pay you the money back. So the stable coins at the moment are outside of the regulatory perimeter, um, not clearly regulated, and are controversial for a number of reasons, one of which is stable coin issuers do not know the end user. And so how, how does a stable coin issuer know, for example, that the instrument that they have issued is not being used by uh, Russian to avoid US sanctions in the context of the Ukraine war and the, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. So these are the runners and riders in this, in this great game. These are the contestants in the most consequential format war we'll ever see in our lives. Because think about the, think about the, the contestants in the field. You've got the central banks competing against the commercial banks, competing against the fintechs, competing against the crypto, crypto uh, community, competing against potentially the big techs. And what they're all seeking to do is capture those transactions, provide the method of payment that will be most suited to this rapidly burgeoning digital economy. And the, the, to me, again, from a banker's perspective, the, the bright dividing line here is between sovereign forms of money and non-sovereign forms of money. You know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, stablecoins, they are not issued under license by the nation state. And, and here comes the real question. And this is where I have to put my cards on the table. It's this question, which was put in my mind by reading the Bitcoin white paper originally. Is money the prerogative of the nation state? Um, should the nation state have a monopoly over the issuance of money and the granting of licenses to other people who are able to issue money? And my answer, and this is just my personal answer, and I would say this is my personal answer and my answer from a professional perspective, is that money is the prerogative of the nation state. And the reason being is that it's one of the monopolies that citizens grant to the nation state as part of the social contract. So in the same way that we grant the nation state the monopoly over creating law, and the same way that we give the nation state monopoly over essentially violence through the military and the police, that money is one of those natural monopolies of the nation state. And therefore, um, you know, each of us has to answer that question. And, and, and that also, I think, helps to um, show the reason why the Libra proposal was so unacceptable to nation states. You know, before Libra came along, central bankers didn't really care too much about Bitcoin. They didn't think it fulfilled the functions of money. But then Libra came along and Libra um, was something remarkable in, in, in terms of the audacity of the proposal, it was essentially saying that a big tech company could have its own central bank and its own sovereign currency, bringing to itself the, an, an important instrument of national power. And that's the reason why nation states balked at that idea, rejected the, the concept, and that's the reason why Libra and DM um, you know, suffered the fate that it did. But no matter where you are on that ideological debate, is money a prerog the prerogative of the nation state, yes or no? Um, one other clear dividing line on this page is that the novel forms of money, the Bitcoins and the Ethereums and the stablecoins, are, are utilizing a particular substrate, are, are utilizing 
different varieties of, of blockchain. And the sovereign currency system is not. The sovereign currency system, if you think about the structure of the databases, so think about this if you're if you're visiting the earth from a if you're an alien visitor to the earth and you're investigating our banking system, you look down on the earth and you see there are about, let's say, 25,000 institutions, 25,000 banks around the world. And each of those 25,000 banks has their own data center. And within those data centers, they have their own database. So that's the structure of databases in the existing banking system. And then you will further observe that those banks make payments to each other by sending electronic messages. And, and essentially what the messages are, the SWIFT messages, the Visa messages, the ACH messages, there are messages moving between different bank databases asking each other to make debits and credits on separate ledgers. And you contrast that to the, the blockchain ecosystem and you come to some interesting conclusions. And the conclusion I come to, again, coming back to the original uh, discussion around the tokenization thesis, the, the question for me is, is there, a, is there a synthesis? Is there a synthesis between the sovereign currency system and the best of blockchain? Now, if you're a crypto maximalist, you're screaming at this point, you're in a rage, I apologize. But I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue down this path, and and again, feel free when I finalise my comments to uh, to let rip. So, Pippin, if you don't mind going to the next page. So, um, I, I believe that there could be a thesis. Uh, I, I could be a, a synthesis between the sovereign currency system and the <clears throat> and blockchain, and and what would that look like? And well, it would look like it would not look like CBDC. CBDC, you have to understand in the context of Libra. Um, central banks didn't like Libra, and they don't want any challenge to the sovereign currency. They also fully recognise that the money issued by the the central bank to the to the citizenry is being used less and less. And that's why the thought process is, well, let's have a CBDC, let's put central bank money in digital, digital form, and that's one way of protecting the sovereign currency system. Well, to, to my mind, um, that's a very narrow uh, frame of analysis because the fact is that most economic actors don't only use central bank liabilities. They don't only use central bank money. For most of us, we use commercial bank money or PayPal money. It's all regulated. It's all sovereign. It's all a liability of a regulated institution. And, and the question that I put, asked myself was, if we're going to adopt blockchain technology in the sovereign currency system, why would we limit the scope to central bank money? And so the idea of regulated liability network is you have to imagine that there is uh, some kind of shared ledger, some kind of blockchain. And in that blockchain, what kind of money do you put in it? And the money that you put in it, if you care about upgrading the sovereign currency system, is central bank money, commercial bank money, and e-money. And in the future, if stable coins are properly regulated, you could even imagine stable coins being in that network. So the regulated liability network is the idea of a common infrastructure, a common substrate that can process the liabilities of different regulated institutions. But it's important to understand that this is, this is as much a legal structure as it is a technology infrastructure. So this shared ledger, this blockchain, needs to operate in the context of what's known as a financial what's known as a financial market infrastructure a financial market infrastructure is a regulated value transfer system and the reason why it needs to be inside an fmi 
is because this thing, this um, payment system needs to be able to achieve finality of settlement. And finality of settlement is a legal construct. It's not a technology construct. construct. It's a legal construct. And that legal construct is brought to life within an FMI. So in blockchain land, I know that a lot of people have this uh, phrase, which is code is law. Um, it isn't, you know, law is law. And so if we're trying to bring together the sovereign currency system and blockchain technology, we've got to bring together the code and the law to make, um, a, you know, make a unit, make a, a structure that works together hand in hand, the technology and the law. So this is the, the, the idea of the regulated liability network. What it really is, is a change of the structure of the databases. So just you know, go with me on this journey. In the 19th century, you had lots of different banks and they had paper ledgers. So if you went to that bank and you gave them your deposit, they would write in their ledger, I owe uh, John Smith $100. And then in the 20th century, um, computers were invented, relational databases were invented. And so each of those institutions, they scrapped their paper ledgers and migrated their record keeping into data centers and relational databases in those data centers. So that's when you, you get this market structure or this database structure where you've got 20, 25,000 banks on the planet and every one of them have got their own data center and inside those data centers are their proprietary books and records. And that's where we are today. And then payments are made by sending messages between those different islands of data. In this concept of a regulated liability network, um, we have a shared ledger. And, and that's, the, that's the key difference between what we have today and what we have in regulated liability network is a common substrate uh, which contains tokens that represent the liabilities of the participating institutions. And all of those, all of the participating institutions are regulated. So there's no Bitcoin on this network, I'm afraid. There's no unregulated stable coins. Everything is a liability of a regulated institution. And then if we move to the next slide, and this uh, will be the wrap up, I'll, I'll tell you about the the proof of concept we're doing in the US, uh, we're doing proof of concepts of this idea in other places as well. Um, but before Christmas, we announced a 12 week proof of concept that's involving um, 10 of the largest banks in the US. My slides have gone create a bit crazy. The names of the institutions are not appearing. You can find them on the internet because the press release was issued. I, um, I put them out on the, on my, uh, you know, email it's okay it's fine Vipin. it's fine I, I mean basically we've got 10 of the largest institutions in the us we've got the new york um fed innovation center participating in simulated transactions on this regulated liability network concept um i cannot give you a preview of the the results but they will be coming out in early may and i, I think we've made some very interesting we've drawn some very interesting conclusions about this paradigm shift from moving from a situation where everyone's working on their own proprietary uh, ledger and database to having this shared space. And uh, we've explored the possibilities of using this shared space um, for, for the settlement of transactions between the participating institutions. Um, there may be further work, uh, further proofs of concepts. We'll talk about that in the papers when they're, when they're published. Um, but I guess if, if, I, if I can summarize, um, you know, what we've been trying to do in this work is to ask ourselves whether we can take shared ledger blockchain technology and apply it to the regulated financial system in a way that upgrades national currency. Now, I, I perfectly understand that there may be people on this call who don't think that's a valid project, who might think it's a Frankenstein's monster, who think that actually we need an alternative to the sovereign currency system and not an upgrade to the sovereign currency system. Um, but that's not my, that's not the plow, that's not the, the furrow that I'm plowing, that's not the direction that I'm uh, I'm working on. 
as you might understand, uh, have been working for a bank. Um, but I, I do think there's more to be investigated into this intersection between the, the best that blockchain has to offer and the good parts of the banking system. And I think with that, I've spoken for long enough and I'm happy to um, open this up to questions and comments. And you'll excuse me for one second if I turn off the camera and have a sneeze, just a second. But you can, you when, can turn uh, off the Tony's, presentation now. When Tony's sneezing, um, you guys should uh, prepare your questions. And of course, do not uh, hesitate to ask any questions. Uh, and when the questions from the audience are exhausted, when and if, I obviously will intervene and ask some questions. But yeah. I wait for you, my uh, co-participants, to drive this forward. And, and feel free to turn off the presentation now. And if people feel like coming on camera to ask the question, then it would be nice to see you. All right. Here uh, looks like. Bobby's raised her hand. Uh, I'm going to turn turn off the um, presentation. Um, stopping the share. And I can see now the whole panoply of participants, Jim and Bobby. Bobby, please. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say this is a lot to get your head around. It's a magnificent concept. Uh, huge. Um, my question, um, I guess, might be a little preliminary, but that central blockchain that everybody's going to be registering the liabilities on, how do you see that being governed? Yeah, that's a great question, Bobby. Um, it, it would have to be governed within an F, within the context of an FMI. Um, there are other large-scale FMIs out there. For example, there is um, continuous link settlement is a good example. Um, there are many others. And those FMIs have to follow rules called the Principles for Financial Market Infrastructures that covers the, the full gamut of, requ of requirements. So the governance is kind of, the guidelines for the governance is set up in the Principles for Financial Market Infrastructures. Um, now, um, the scheme that we imagine is a multi-currency scheme, so it would have to be it would have to have a college of regulators, meaning multiple regulators working on it. Um, but that's that's a scenario that we've already seen in the example of CLS, which is uh, an FMI in the foreign exchange market. Uh, now, money has asked a question on chat. Uh, assuming all. Uh legal technological hurdles are met, when would you think a first commercial testnet could be built? Um, we've, I mean, we haven't got anything live yet. We've got sandboxes, um, I, I would say within about three years. I mean, building an FMI takes, uh, it takes years. Um, he's talking about a commercial testnet. He is, he's not even, asking about a, uh, a commercial testnet in the sense yeah. more than just the participants who are now registered. I, I am speaking for money, but I think that's where he's going. Meaning yeah. I know that he, you know, he operates a company that has uh, that, ha you know, a small player, but very significant uh, player, OTC yeah. Digital. And, uh, you know, he's been building stuff. So he wants to participate, obviously, if such players have to enter the market, I have to test this uh, concept, they have to be allowed in because the 10 biggest banks uh, by themselves or the 10 biggest uh, players in the payment space uh, probably will make some uh, basic mistakes. Let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, sure you're, I'm sure you're correct. And um, I think in, in future stages of work, we'll try to be more inclusive of um, other technology partners and other ecosystem partners. Um, I think very importantly, at the moment, the sandbox that we've created is based upon a private permission uh, ledger. Now, look, I think um, this is one of the fundamental questions, which is, can we get to the stage where regulated business operates on a public network? And this is going to be a journey. 
if you think about this from a, a, a bank perspective, then using a public network like Ethereum is evaluated like an outsourcing. So, you know, if you if you imagine, if let's say that you're sitting in Citibank in the IT department and you say, hey, you know what? It wouldn't be great if we closed down all of our data centers and we used AWS. Then, yeah, it might, it might be great. You might save half of the costs of running the bank. Um, but you have to go through something called third-party risk assessment. And you have to figure out whether you can you can move your applications onto AWS in a safe in a safe manner. So at the moment, it's very hard to see how a network like Ethereum would pass muster on, on third-party risk management or outsourcing requirements that a, a regulated bank has. Um, but nevertheless, the, the question is: imagine in the future that you know, real business migrates to Ethereum. I mean, be, real B2B business and it becomes a commerce platform. And in, in that future, the, the money needs to be where the, where the clients are. The money needs to be where the transactions are, where the real transactions are. And so my personal view is that we're at this stage where Private permission is a safer play for the for the banks to investigate in, but probably at some point in the future, it needs to migrate to to public networks. But there is, I'll point at one major major issue. I mean, can can you imagine? Can you imagine that it's acceptable? It would be acceptable for a bank like Citibank to be on Ethereum. And for Citibank to be paying gas fees that end up with a North Korean validator? I mean, absolutely not. Absolutely Yeah, yeah. Not. I mean, I, I don't think he's asking that question. It's just a very simple thing, which is uh, basically when will a commercial testnet be available? Not Ethereum, not, you know, we're not talking about um, public versus private or anything like that. I mean, he's just talking about his own reality, which is, he could put, he could contribute yeah. to this uh, well, in the regulated space. But since he's a small player, he, he you know, anyway, we can go to the other questions. Yeah. This is the question if, that if anyone's interested to know more, then please have a look at the white paper. The regulated liability network.org uh, has the white paper and reach out to me and we can discuss potential future collaboration. But I thought it was I thought it was important to um, use that opportunity to to point out that the, this leap to public chain for the regulated sector um, is quite difficult to achieve. True. Um, now, Jim uh, Mason, who now I believe works for uh, DTCC, uh, is raised his hand, uh, but he has also uh, pushed out a couple, you know, a few questions. Here, I think the one question is, can you discuss the difference between uh, the digital asset uh, you know, prototypes on the FMIs versus the unregulated uh, D5 networks of today? But before we go there, let me tell you that digital assets um, was the one who contributed the name Hyperledger uh, because when they first formed, uh, it was, uh, you know, they acquired a company with the name Hyperledger and Hyperledger itself, uh, I mean, digital assets were a member of uh, Hyperledger and I don't know whether they still are, but Brooke Masters was one of our prime movers right in the beginning. So I just wanted to remind you that we have uh, impeccable uh, credentials, impeccable sort of, uh, uh, provenance, uh, uh, and uh, maybe you didn't know this, but this is what why I'm stating it. But anyway, going back to the uh, difference between the DAM product types on FMIs versus the unregulated DeFi networks today. Yeah, Jim, I, I don't want to make the same mistake and, and not answer your question. Do you want to? Uh, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I've sat on both sides of this. So you know, the DeFi world has been around a lot longer than I've been in it, I'll say. So my 
My nephew is actually a committer on the Bitcoin network. He actually writes the libraries for them. Um, so, you know, that's so in our own family, we're split. Let's put it that yeah. way. It's it's like a personal war. I don't give him Christmas <laughs> gifts. He doesn't give me Christmas gifts. So we're, we're fair that way. Yeah. But, um, what's, but you've made a few points and I've been in this space and I probably spent most of my day every day uh, working in this space. And what's there are multiple um, I'll initiatives that are going on. And RLN is one of them, obviously. The yeah. CBDC, multi CBDC, uh, sorry, Swift CBDC project last year was another one too, and there's other ones as well. But I, but I will say what one of the things that separated RLN in my mind from some of the others, I think the concepts behind it weren't so different than the other ones. What really separated it was more how it's evolved as a model. So to me, and I, I missed the first part of the session here. Maybe you might have pointed that out a little bit. But I think one of the things about RLN that's different is yes, you know, City was a prime driver in the whole thing, but you've evolved it to the point that it's an independent organization, which is really one of the critical things that's needed. If there's 10 critical success factors to make this thing happen right, that was one of them. And so, yeah. um, you know, that's that's a very good foundation uh, to build on going forward. So you're, you're right that you're wrapping up your uh first phase poc this month and you'll have results in may and kind of like the swift thing i'm sure there'll be additional phases on it and back to manny's point i'm sure later phases will look for broader participation as well and yes. it, it's not a quick thing but if i had to as a like somebody who sits on the sideline watching football games and placing bets my bet is it's living in the world of regulated finance it's infinitely easier to take regulated finance and make it efficient and a more open model um, easily than it is to go the opposite route and try to make Bitcoin, uh, I'll call it regulatory compliant every jurisdiction that it participates in and offer all yeah. of the flexibility for settlement and participation. That Bitcoin I think I have to give, uh, I think I have to give Jim his own uh, presentation. Yeah, do so, yeah. <laughs> and it looks and like look, one you know, one of the, sorry, we've been going. Uh, no, no, um, because he hasn't asked the question. That's why I'm saying that. <laughs> no, well, but actually, sorry, useful. I was pushing back on Tony, actually specifically around the evolution of the RLN model yeah. itself, because I think that's actually a pretty important thing. And I, I, I'm sort of grading it, in my opinion, as more of an A model approach to the problem than some of the other projects that have been trying to do the same thing. So if I yeah. actually looked and said, here's Libra and here's RLN, I would say, wow, what a difference in terms of the establishment of a foundation that could move forward versus one that sort of never had a real shot in my mind out of the box. Yeah, well, that, that's true, Jim. And um, I'll share with you uh, a small, it shouldn't really be a secret, but in, you know, ever, ever since the, even before, even before blockchain came along, you will, you will not, you cannot believe the number of approaches and pitches that I've, I've gotten over the years where the core pitch is this, hey, wouldn't it be great if everyone in the world used my platform? How, how, how much efficiency there would be if only everyone would use my platform? And here's the hundred reasons why my platform is the best. And you know, when you when you lead with that argument, which is, hey, wouldn't it be great if everyone used my platform? Um, that that's not the road to adoption. And so no, in, it's not. In, in RLN, in RLN, the road the RLN is designed to maximize adoption. And that's why RLN is technologically neutral. The RLN concept can work on. Um, any private or public DLT, the RLN concept, frankly, can work on an Oracle database because really what we're saying is let's have a shared ledger and that can be implemented in many ways. So that so one critical thing is ad adoption is the whole of the law. Yep. Absolutely. And so the funny part of it is there are all these what I call different dimensions to, in a sense, the monetary challenge, if you will, uh, for everything, for asset settlement, the whole thing, all these different dimensions. You've mentioned some of the dimensions here. The other thing that's really interesting too, and we're doing the same thing, is everywhere I go, all I do is I rip out what I call technology. So the stupid thing is I'm a DLT architect. And what do I do all day long? Say, Tony, give me that paper, get rid of DLT. What? But it is, no, no, we're going to throw it out. 
So I'm the one, I'm like a DLT policeman here saying, no, we can't use, I don't want to use the term hyperledger, I don't want to use DLT. I want all that stuff stricken from all these documents. They're going, but, 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 I'm like, no, yeah. I am the DLT cop here. And so the, the reason I'm getting rid of it is we have to be, as you say, capability focused, not technology focused. And so yeah. I, I say things like, if you want to put in the concept of shared ledger, that can be implemented any way you want. And it, yeah. it can actually have multiple implementations. Him, but when you start telling me it's DLT, you've locked me into something that shouldn't be there. So that's yeah. all I do as a cop, is issue tickets to people who are violating uh, protocol on that stuff. We've got a meeting yep. of minds, Jim, and I think also if you're if you're at DTCC, then let's have a chat because one of the future directions for RLN is multi-asset, and uh, we're very interested in things like the tri-party repo market. So maybe we should have an offline chat. Sure, sounds good. Uh, Thank you. It looks like uh, Mark is Mark Liberati, who's uh, probably from the other end of the spectrum, uh, but uh, he is uh, definitely. Um, uh, got a question and I wanted to give him a chance. Mark. <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Vipin. And uh, thank you, Tony, very much for this uh, presentation. I was just thinking of, and a bit building on what Jim just said on uh, the capability functionality, looking at these other sort of big picture um, digital initiatives that really could, you know, to align with what you're trying to overall accomplish. And I was thinking particularly about uh, self-sovereign identity, decentralized identity, digital identity in general, yeah. and sort of how you're taking this into your uh, into your plan going forward. Over, thank you, Mark. That's a that's a great a great question, and um, one of the so one of the things that is in the design of RLN is there are no bearer bearer instruments. Um, I I don't like in the in the financial system. We've been trying to get rid of bearer instruments for the past few decades. Um, if you want to know about the danger, I think the best illustration of the danger of bearer instruments is the movie Die Hard. Um, you know, if you think about the end of the movie Die Hard, where this guy who was pretending to be a terrorist, he was just a thief and he was breaking into the, sa the safe at the, what was it, the Nakamoto Tower? I can't remember. But anyway, inside, the, inside that safe were a bunch of bearer instruments. And that just illustrates that criminals will do whatever it takes to get their hands on bearer instruments. So in, in RLN, we don't have bearer instruments. The, the tokens represent the liability of an institution towards their own client. Now, the only way we can break out of that paradigm is if we have the solutions that you're talking about, Mark, in terms of the self-sovereign identity, the verified credentials, I believe that that's something that JP Morgan used in their Project Guardian in, in Singapore. Um, but if there's a, if, let me just make it very clear. If Citibank were to issue a token on Ethereum, it cannot be that that token is used by a Russian to avoid sanctions. It cannot be. And that's the danger, I think, with the current paradigm of stable coins. The issuers do not know the end user. And, and that is a very dangerous, that's an extremely dangerous situation to be in. Yeah, talking about bearer instruments, the most uh, commonly used bearer instruments to avoid all this is the US dollar. And in fact, uh, there are um, of the coin, of the notes in circulation, uh, maybe 60 to 70% of them are outside uh, uh, the US and probably being used in, in certain ways. <laughs> Uh, yeah. The, the, well, Steve, ben, I've got I've got a response to that point because I hear that point a lot. But there's hold, a hold, there's hold a, on, hold on. Before before we go on, I'm going to say that we can extend this call by a few more minutes, uh, unless somebody else comes along to claim this very spot. So go go ahead, Tony. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear that I hear that counter argument a lot, and it. it it, there's a but there's a, a clear difference, and the clear difference is that the U.S. dollar is issued by the nation state, and presumably they know what they're doing when they issue that instrument. Now, the the, the nation no. state, the, the <laughs> no, well, hold on, let me let me complete let me complete my thought. The the, the, nation, the nation state issues the instruments that it wants to issue under their sovereign right to do so, but what you can't have 
is a private mint coming along without a license and issuing their own US dollars. Um, in the same way that, and I'll give you this, this um, you know, tech, just because you can do something from a technology perspective doesn't mean, mean it's legal. So when laser photocopiers were invented, it made copying US dollars easier. It didn't make copying US dollars legal. And so a DLT is a kind of digital printing press. It may enable you to print your own US dollars, but it doesn't make it legal. True. Um, I, I, what I was saying when I said no, I'm sorry uh, I interrupted you, but what I'm saying is basically these are emergent effects. Nobody knew that the US dollar issued in whatever, started issuing, uh, you know, 1913. 1913. Yeah. Yes. Before that, there were, you know, a wide variety of them, but nobody even uh, posited that 60% of that would be. So similarly, I think that the, the thing with technology or the thing with uh, something that is out of the box is that uh, it possesses emergent properties. Yeah. And, uh, and we cannot sitting here say what uh, what is the so that's why I said no, <laughs> because yeah. I think that uh, anyway. Uh, so anyway. To, uh, um, uh, I think uh, money is asked the question again about uh, about JPM coin, which you just briefly touched upon in Guardian uh, thing, uh, and I had written about it uh, when it first came out. Maybe it was what 2017, 2018, 2017. Yeah. Like that. I mean, JP Morgan, I, I, I really acknowledge their contribution with, you know, because they actually took the trouble to do the basic work on Quorum and JP Morgan coin. They've, they've, they've done a lot of developments on that. But at the end of the day, a coin issued by a single bank is a casino chip, meaning it only, or a, a Disneyland token, if you like, meaning it only works within one institution. And that's not a market structure that is uh, it's desirable. So you can you can think about RLN being a multi-bank JP Morgan coin, um, or an interoperable network of of coins that are like JP Morgan coin. But it cannot be the end destination to have each bank issue their own coin as a proprietary instrument. So we have um, a, a couple of other questions, but mostly around the same or similar uh, type of deal. Uh, so uh, the um, the thing about um, you know the bright line between these two um, types of systems. This is me now asking a yeah. question, which yeah. is. Uh, my observation is that stable coins really are a uh, Frankenstein's monster, like you said. So in a <laughs> sense, it is the bridge between, uh, between the undead and the dead uh, and the living yeah. I mean, or the <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever bright line you want to uh, want to draw. It, this is some kind of a, uh, some arch over these two types of systems. So in a sense, I, I feel that there is a continuum being created, not, not a compartmentalized system, but some are more like the others than the other, you know, some of them, you know, so yeah. they, it's a spectrum. You're, you're right, but, you know, obviously in the crypto winter, you had the resurgence of the, of the Bitcoin maximalists. And um, I have to say, I mean, I, I kind of respect more the people who are in firmly in one camp or another. You know, if you go back to the, the original Bitcoin white paper where it envisages a world without intermediaries, I mean, is the crypto ecosystem a world without inter intermediaries? It is not. I mean, talk about rent seeking, um, yeah. uh, you know, intermediaries. Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I've, got, I've got more time for the, actually, actually I've, got, I've got more time for the Bitcoin maximalists Sorry, hold on, hold on. 
hold on, uh, Tony. I think I, for some strange reason, muted you. No, that's okay. that's quite okay. It's another. You you've got the power. No, no, no. You. Uh, that censorship, Vipin. This is against the philosophy. Um, but look, I I was just saying that I've got more time for the for the folks who are ideologically pure in this, and if you believe in the Bitcoin thesis or the you know Vitalik's vision for Ethereum, then at least that's driven by a kind of intellectual purity, and it's not just about making not just about making money. Um, so I, I I'd rather people were in. I think some of these things in the middle are Frankenstein's monsters that cannot be saved. Um, and yeah, that's my that's my view on that one. Um, well, I have to counter with with something which says that uh, engineering is all about compromises in the end because, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's not uh, the the purists uh, uh, cannot exist in a dirty world because the world is uh, not you know it's organic I mean, it doesn't mean that there's something lacking in the world but it's just that it is it is not uh, a mental construct an abstraction but that, rather, that's true that's true, but some some hybrids work in the world, and some hybrids don't. You know, a, a, duck, a duck and a you know a duck and a goose may be able to produce a successful offspring, but a cat and a dog can't. <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, now, uh, the other thing is, you said that the ultimate uh, you know counterparty is the central bank. Um, depends on which central bank. Yeah, central bank of Zimbabwe is a little less uh, of a sound counterparty than, yeah, let's say the central bank uh, the of, of Britain. Yeah, or even you know, <laughs> again shades of uh, <laughs> uh, you know, not that, that black may, or white but grey. That may that may be so, but you but. <laughs> What what right do outsiders have to impose uh, or provide an alternative to 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 the citizens of Zimbabwe? The, the the citizens of Zimbabwe and the government of Zimbabwe is sovereign in their own jurisdiction, and so what right does an outsider say? Hey, I'm going to provide an alternative form of money to the citizens of Zimbabwe. Now, the the, the Zimbabwe government, like them or not. Um, have the perfect sovereign right to resist attempts for their for their currency to be debased, and uh, you know so so I you know I I would I would respect the the sovereign rights of um, any nation states to um, in, enforce enforce their sovereignty. That's true, but uh, the citizens of Zimbabwe obviously uh, will find other methods to. Uh, either store their value or to make payments uh, because they do not, you know, it's it's in the end, it's a rule of law question. And it's uh, whether you trust your counterparty, whether you are inside the country, a citizen of that country or not. So, yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll, you know, so there's more adoption, for example, for Bitcoin in, they say in Nigeria, in Africa, in, in general, because of the quality of uh, governance. Yeah. Not because the citizens are bound to do this, they they don't mind uh, bending the law uh, to. So again, coming back to practical reality, yeah, which is uh, a concrete thing. Um, yeah. So we might end in a, another uh, four or five minutes, but um, if you have, uh, you know, if, before you close, I would uh, urge you to have either you or somebody else present on this um, finished prototype, finished, uh, you know, RLN um, findings uh, on this uh, channel, if possible. Um, um, other than that, you know, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I do see some people talking about, uh, you know, mostly it's not questions, it's statements, but that's fine. Um, um, Dan, 
you have something to ask? Please. You haven't uh, unmuted them. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, interesting, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, curious. So from a cap, looking at this from capital markets perspective, uh, obviously settlement payment is critical, but so much of capital markets is really shared ledger. I mean, it, OTC drove is our great example of collateral, another, it goes on, settlement of securities and so on. And curious whether, so there's an obvious use case for shared ledger um, in capital markets, um, whether people are ready to acknowledge it or not. Um, curious if there's been the beginnings of um, prototyping, thinking about how this might evolve um, in that way. It's a you know similarly constrained market. We don't yeah. let everybody play. So, yeah. Absolutely, Dan. You know, I, I would say that, um, again, adoption is the whole of the law. So, you know, so, man, so many of these uh, um, proposed ecosystems, like, I mean, we, see, we just saw trade, you know, trade lens um, collapse and uh, other projects have, have collapsed. So, so many of these projects come down not to technology, but to, adopt, to adoption. Sure. And uh, and I and I think whenever you lead with technology and whenever you turn up to an adoption fight with a technology knife, you lose. Yeah. <laughs> so and capital markets have is obviously one where you know number one you get loads of different technologies driving, which are you know which are vested interests trying to establish their new infrastructure. Exactly. And, um, so, you know, clearly. Uh, I guess the industry has to drive. I was. I think you can translate my question is, uh, city would be a um, material participant in the industry driving. Are you aware of those kinds of initiatives which um, look like they could be the source of some momentum? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would look for the use cases that have the biggest potential delta benefit. So in RLN phase one, it's cross-border payments in US dollars. In RLN phase two, it may be tri-party repo, it may be intraday repo, it may be intraday FX swaps. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I tend to focus on the, um, on the places where there's the biggest potential delta, delta benefit. And and when when you see these reports coming out in in May, you you tell me if we've identified the big delta benefit. I think we have. I think we have. Uh, yeah, collateral question. management would obviously be a, a one. I think OTC derivatives would be another. But. Yeah, but please let you know, Dan. Let's have a conversation offline. Take it forward. Uh, the last question from uh, Money, um, uh, who has got his hand raised, so I'm going to defer to his question right now. Yeah, um, hi Tony, thank you again. The, just want to one clarification with respect to JP Morgan coin versus the recent paper on deposit coin. Yeah. How, what, what, what is the nuance between those two? I, I think simply that JP Morgan coin is an instance of a deposit coin. Uh, uh, you know, that, that paper on deposit tokens was written by Oliver Wyman with JP Morgan. And I think what they were doing was promoting the idea of a token that represents a bank deposit. So it's just the generalization of the JP Morgan coin. And RLN is a generalization of the JP of the JP Morgan coin concept as well. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the that's the context for that one. Yeah, we definitely would like to follow up with you as we've been pointed out. We have been working on yeah, on uh, security tokens, regulated security tokens for the past four, four and a half years, working with yeah. various players. Uh, would like to you know, show what we have and how we can, you know, be a participant in, in your future. Absolutely. Um, please, please reach out. I mean, I think one, if I can just close on this one final comment, which I, I think is a, is a deep and important point, which is a legal instrument is independent from the technology used to represent it. So again, in the 19th century, we wrote down these legal instruments on bits of paper. And then in the 20th century, we wrote them on relational databases. And in the 21st century, century, we might write them on a different kind of database, which is a shared ledger. 
But through that, through that technology progression, the legal instrument is the same, is, the, is identical. And there's no reason that you need different rules for putting a legal instrument onto a different technology. So again, I think one of the, the, one of the ways you synthesize between these worlds is you move beyond this idea that code is law. It's not. Law is law and code is code. And we have to find a synthesis between them. Um, that's how we move forward. On that uh, wonderful note, um, uh, we go back to the Sumerians with their uh, marks on the clay tablets, which uh, represented the first uh, ledger. And then we also come to the uh, uh, code is law and our thesis, my thesis, which I've uh, sort of put forth as a paper, is if code is law, then law should be code. In uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Using an autonomous system to control another autonomous system is a very old engineering concept. I like From that the governors one. of uh, you know car speeds to uh, you know all kinds of stuff. So you know, e including yeah. today's circuit breakers in uh, equity markets, they are all um, automated. I mean, no human can react um, in the uh, speed at which. So we we have a whole thesis on that. Money and I also have written a pretty comprehensive paper on um, CBDCs. Okay, uh, and. Furthermore, we created in, uh, in 2020, a wholesale CBDC in Hyperledger Labs called eTaler, okay. uh, which, which was presented uh, to uh, you know, Bank of England, World Bank, and they, they all thought it was fantastic, but of course we are just small players. So you know, it just fell by the wayside, but uh, it is still alive. And we are going to take it forward, probably. Uh, but thank you, Tony, for showing up and uh, you know, in the midst of a great uh, personal uh, <laughs> struggle. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And it's very great to hear you and you know, have this discussion, this debate. Yeah. Hopefully uh, by May or June, um, you know, you can also send uh, a, a delegate, but someone as accomplished as you. Thank you. Vipin, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, thanks everyone for the engaging discussion. Thank you very much. I very much appreciated it. Enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, bye -bye. this recording will be available uh, both uh, on our site and on YouTube. Normally it's streamed, but today we couldn't do it. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye.